Hey guys, welcome back to the Tony Robbins podcast as we continue our real breakthrough series. If you're a business owner, then you know the power of developing and executing a world-class marketing strategy. But how do you go about creating that world-class marketing plan that's going to set you apart from your competition? How do you find and convey your unique selling proposition? Marketing isn't just about doing something unique. It's about adding more value than anyone else, doing more for your customer than anyone else. In this episode, we're taking you to Business Mastery, where you're going to hear Tony speak with Darcy, a woman who is struggling to find her niche, even despite an impressive resume of clients. Darcy runs a successful production company, and she works with some of the biggest companies around the world. But up to this point, Darcy's relied on word of mouth to propel her business growth. And while her referrals have gotten her up to a certain point, it's not enough to create the massive impact that she longs for. She needs a world-class marketing strategy. Listen carefully. You're going to hear Tony show Darcy how to move out of her own way and eliminate the beliefs that hold her back you're going to learn exactly how you can start to find your own unique niche and start building the brand that's going to take your company to the next level. Because if you do what everyone else is doing just a little bit better, you're going to get an incremental return. But if you do what no one else is doing, you're going to find geometric rewards. Isn't it time you stepped up your game? What's your name? Where are you from? Darcy, I'm from Oregon. Darcy. Darcy, what business are you in? Production. And production of what? Photography mostly and some video. Okay. How's business? Great. Okay. And what's your definition of great? We're busy. Uh, we have <laughs> <laughs> raving fans, excellent okay. clients. Okay. Blessed. Are you profitable? Yes. Good cash flow? Yes. What do you want that you don't have? A uh, similar story as his uh, to grow. Okay, and what's More preventing people like that myself. growth? Um, me. Okay, and what within you specifically? Um, I think the biggest challenge, our shoots happen anywhere over the world. So I'm bringing big teams together in different cities. So I'm finding it hard in my head to figure out how to have more of me when clients don't want to pay for travel and I'm bringing teams together all over the world. So what would prevent you from finding teams all over the world that live locally, contracting, framing your ideas about what you want to create out of that production so you can still be the driving strategic approach, but then finding people there so that you eliminate the need for the flight so the customer gets more value for less money and you don't have to worry about those logistics? So if I do that in Japan, and I have no work in Japan, I'm paying people who aren't doing anything. Okay, now I want you to notice how the mind of the mind, not her mind, this is not a new thought. This is the limiting thought that most people have. Who says you have to hire people? Why can't you have contractors that you've developed a relationship with who you say, I might send you one thing of business, it might be 10, I don't know, but you're the best in the area, and would you like me to refer some business to you in partnership with you? Got it. So I do that. Okay. And so if you do that, can you not do it in the major areas in which you do business? Yes. But the problem I'm having is there's other companies like me. And if people are good, they may be working with them on other jobs and not be available. Okay. So they might not be available when you need them. That's very possible. So the question becomes, can you generate, how do you generate the business that you have currently? Most of it's word of mouth and just 25 years of being in business. So here's a beautiful thing. She's added a lot of what? Over a decade, she's built the brand. She has people that seek her out. That's her greatest limitation. Because she has a one-trick pony. It's called word of mouth. And it's really nice because it costs nothing. And it's really horrible because it's not predictable with consistency. So you don't have a business. What you have is a great reputation and business comes and it flows and then you try to figure out how to scramble and do it. Now you're running up against these obstacles that are there. But in truth, if you really think about what your business is, 
I don't want to ever have a business that has one leg of marketing. What happens if you got a one-legged stool? How likely is it something's going to happen at some point to disrupt that if you only have one leg? And if the one leg goes, where does your business go? Right? I always want to build a Parthenon. I want lots of ways to bring business in. And I don't care what business I've ever entered into. Almost all of them have one or two or maybe three things. And I want six or seven. Because with six or seven, you knock down three or four of my legs and I'm still standing tall. This week, that should be your number one focus. How am I going to turn this into a business that is driven as opposed to a business that reacts? Right now, you wait, the business comes to you, then you got to figure out, try to meet the needs, then you got to figure out where it is, then you got to deal with the additional expense, then you got to figure out, can I find the people? Versus if you decided there was a particular niche that you were going to go own completely, you can still have the business that comes to you that can be all over, but if I said there was a, an area where you could really own that area, you could have a niche, you could have something that people go, holy shit, this firm, this woman, this group is the best at, what would that niche be? And while I'm asking her that, I want you to know I'm only asking her this question. I am not asking you to ever think of the answers to these questions for your own business. I want you to resist the temptation to answer this for yourself. See, the other day I saw an article about a a Girl Scout that sold more cookies than anyone in the history of the Girl Scouts. And so I was curious, so I dug in to find more, made a few phone calls and found out that this Girl Scout is in San Francisco and she parks herself outside of the marijuana uh, places, <laughs> discrepancies, and sells cookies there and people are higher than <laughs> kites and they're like starving. They buy whole boxes of cookies, it's a true thing. <laughs> she understands her niche. Right? You gotta, you gotta understand your niche. By the way, she's built a little brand for herself with these people. They all know who she is. They all wanna do business with her. I have a friend who, his name's Michael Glickman. He lives in um, the San Fernando Valley of Los Angeles, if you're familiar with that area. And we were both kids. I was like, I think I'm two years older than him. I think it was like 19, he was 17, and we met. And he's a really passionate guy, and he loved real estate. And his whole goal, I asked him what his goal was, was to become a great realtor. But at 17, he wasn't legal to sell yet. So he'd get on his bicycle, because he didn't own a car yet. And in those days, there was no internet. So the way you'd market your homes is you'd have these, and they still have some of these paper devices with like, you know, a little book with, you know, 100 homes for sale. And he would get paid to go distribute those on his bike. And when he turned 18, he immediately got his license and became you know, a real estate salesman. And if you know how the real estate business works, most people do the same thing. What do most realtors do? They have a farm, an area they work, they knock on doors to try to get listings. When they get a listing, what do they do? They do ads, they put signs, and what else do they do? They have open what? Houses. They all do the same shit. If you do the same thing as everybody else and you do it 10 times better, you're gonna get an incremental advantage. But if you do what no one else does, you can get a geometric advantage. And that difference is a different business. So I'm talking to him and I'm saying, what happened in the first year, he did not make one sale. He had to go do other work to keep himself alive. And he was very frustrated. And why? He said, because I'm so young and people don't want to do business with the new guy on the block. He, he lived and worked in a high-end community, a rich community, relatively wealthy community. And he's the new kid on the block. So I said to him, what you need is to become a brand. What you need is to become an identity that people want to do business with you. If I said to all of you right now, think of a soft drink, the name of a large soft drink company, the first one that comes to your mind, write it down. Don't say it, write it down. Large soft drink company. And then I want you to immediately write down, think of... What's a large computer company? First one that comes to mind for you. Large computer company, put it down, write it down. And then think of a a luxury car company. Luxury car company, what's first one pops your mind? Big luxury car company. And then maybe the last one, think of what is a search engine? First one that pops in your mind, search engine. Let's look at these just for a moment. 
I'll throw them up on the screen and let's see. So I say soft drink, how many of you thought of Coca-Cola? Raise your hand if you thought of Coca-Cola. Now look at the, keep your hand up, look at the percentage of the room that thought of this one company. Look around. It's 98% of the room. What the fuck happened to Dr. Pepper? <laughs> right? How many thought of Pepsi? Raise your hand. And look at poor little Pepsi. It's not even 3% of the room, 2% of the room. Is that wild? Do you think you have a little advantage that when you say the category of the product that 98% of the room thinks of one company? Computer company, raise your hand if you thought of Apple. Raise your hand. Keep your hands up, look at the percentage that thinks of Apple. When we think of any computer company, 98% of the room. Raise your hand if you thought of Dell. Poor f Dell, look at Dell. <laughs> Barely breathing out there still. How many of you, uh, how many of you thought of Google for the, oh, luxury car company, let's try. How many thought of Mercedes? Raise your hand if you thought of Mercedes. Keep your hands up, look at the percentage that thought of Mercedes, including the man that wants revenge. 85. How many thought of BMW? Raise your hand. Okay, so those two are a little closer, but Mercedes dominates. How many thought of Google as the search engine? Let me see a show of hands. Look at the percentage that thought of Google. It's like 99%. How many of you thought of Yahoo? <laughs> Four Yahoos on drugs. That's who thought of it, right? Four people. How many thought of Bing? Bing. Who? <laughs> Two people thought of Bing, and that's Microsoft, right? How powerful would it be that if when people thought of your category, they thought of you? I'll tell you what pisses off, totally pisses off the people at UPS when you say FedEx this. <laughs> like, it's not FedEx, it's shipping over night. You know what the people at Scott Tissues hate when you say, pass me the Kleenex? <laughs> it's not Kleenex, it's tissue. Are there brands that are so in your mind that when you think of the category, you think of them first, yes or no? Yes or no? So mine was, if there's any area to create a breakthrough or improve your life, I wanted to be that for the whole world. I made that decision and I've done it. I'm the most dominant in all those categories. You can be dominant in any category. So I said to my friend Mike, and I'm just a kid at the time, I said, we gotta find a way for you to do something that sets you apart from everyone else. And it needs to be different than what you're thinking. And I said, I don't know what it is, but we gotta find some way so that people like you, respect you, trust you, and it needs to be not you trying to market because you don't have that kind of money anyway. It needs you do something that makes you worthy of being branded and an opportunity showed up. One day, there was a trash strike in Encino, California, which is upscale community where he had his, his business. And the trash strike, people thought would last a week, but four weeks into it, it looked like no solution in sight. What happens after four weeks of trash building up in a wealthy community outside their houses? Tell me what happens. Dogs, cats, rats, gets knocked over the place. People are used to this pristine community. It's filthy, it smells. What kind of emotional states do people that are wealthy feel when they start seeing their whole community breaking down and there's nobody taking away their trash? You think they're happy or angry? Very angry. So my buddy, funny, it wasn't my idea. He did it on his own. I just said, you gotta find the thing and he figured it out. He called me up, he goes, what do you think if I go and I hire a private service that take all the trash out of my farm. I said, I think that's brilliant. He goes, I'm gonna do it and tell everybody I did it. I said, that's the only part I wouldn't do. Don't tell anybody you did it. He goes, why the hell would I do it then? I said, trust me, just deliver the value. People will find out. And when they find out, do not let them pay you under any circumstances. Be the guy that adds value. He goes, I understand. I said, how much is it gonna cost you? He goes, well, I'm not sure, but..." I don't remember the total number. I think it was like $4,000, which for him would be like 40,000 in those days. But I said, buddy, it'll be the best money you ever spent. He did it. Now I want you to picture this. He became a brand overnight. How? You come home to your rich community, your smelly ass community, and it's pristine clean. You're like, oh, thank God the trash strike's over. You turn on the news that night and what does it say? We're on day 39 of the trash strike.
and stole my trash. <laughs> Where did my trash go? I thought the trash, how come our trash is gone? And people started trying to figure out where the trash went. And everybody's calling everybody, this is unbelievable. The trash strike's going on. Where's our trash? Our community's so great. This went on for about 10 days. And at some point, the information leaked out. Don't know how. <laughs> and Mike starts getting all these phone calls. Did you do that? Well, I didn't tell anybody, but yes. Oh my God, why did I think of that? I want to pay my part. Nope, I won't let you do that. What? No, no, it's not fair for you to do this. Yes, it is fair. I work in this community, I love this community, this community was becoming filthy, so I decided to take matters in my own hands to protect the community. That's unbelievable, come on, let me pay you. Absolutely not, well what can I do for you? Well, if you ever wanna sell your home, if you know anybody ever wants to sell theirs, if you ever like to list your home, you ever wanna move, I hope you'll think of me. He made $1.2 million in commissions over four years and sold 99% of all properties that sold in that community for four years. And then he started his own office and dominated the entire community. All from a $4,000 investment, ladies and gentlemen, not bad. So tell me, what's the niche you could own? What's the brand you could own? If you were creative, if you thought outside the nine dots. Definitely. Why should I do business with you versus anyone else? If you can't answer that question in a compelling way, you don't have an effective business. You might have something that would be effective if you get it to people, but you're not an effective marketer. You should be able to tell people what your business is and at least in a room this size get 30, 40, 50% of the people to be interested. If you're not doing that, you're failing miserably. Which by the way, you can go from failure to success by just iterating. Let's try something else, try something else. Don't beat yourself up, just let me try something else. That didn't work, okay, try something else. If you try something and it doesn't work, what should you do? Try something else. If that doesn't work, if you're gonna succeed, what should you do? And if that doesn't work, what do you do? And if that doesn't work, what do you do? How, do you get, how long do you give your average child to learn how to walk before you tell them, you've tried too many times, it's not gonna happen. <laughs> just give it up, you're not a Walker. You go, what are you crazy? My kid's gonna keep trying until he or she walks. No wonder almost everybody walks. So tell me, what's the area that could be your niche? Why should I buy from you versus someone else? The current niche is photography and we produce these very complicated shoots. So the niche is when people hire me and my production company, they know they're gonna get the maximum value in a day for the least amount of money, someone that's keeping it on schedule, knocking it out of the park, bringing great teams together, real positive environments. People leave really excited. But these shoots are super complicated. It's exhausting. I'd love to have more simpler shoots, or, but that is our current niche. Very complicated shoots for clients like Apple, Salesforce, Amazon. I mean, we're, we're busy and I'd like to expand the business and have more people like me that can do this. We've talked about that here. Yes, what's preventing that? It's definitely me. Well, what within you? What belief? Because are you starting to see the pattern, everybody? I mean, could we come up with 20 ways to do this? But whatever ways right. we come up with will be worthless because their brain's still gonna go, yeah, but. The yeah, but is what's f***ing it all up. The strategies are not that complex. And between all of us in this room, we could all help her, not just me, right? We could brainstorm together. Worthless if we don't make this shift. So what is it within you? What's the belief? I completely believe and have several people in mind to do this, but the conversations that happen over the phone with different photographers, I'm working with very successful photographers and companies, it's that moment you say, I'm not sure who will be on set with you, like which member of our team, and that's where the conversation shifts, and that's what I hear, and I'm struggling with how to have more producers that do what I do, do it well, with people being like, yes, no problem. To grow your business 30%, how many more people would you need to get of this nature? Two. Great, and you're not capable of doing that? Oh, I am. <laughs> Absolutely. Where are you gonna find these two? I already know who they are. Then why are we having this conversation? <laughs> she knows who they are. It's only two, a planet of seven billion people. 
I'm confused. I agree with you. How do I get everybody else that is hiring our company to shift as well? To be like, okay, it's not you on set. It'll be Rebecca or Danielle. Awesome. All you have to do, you train people. We train people all the time. We train people by our states. Your hesitancy, they have hesitancy, but so do you. And they feel that in you. I feel it in you and I don't even know you. So I absolutely know your people would feel it in you. We're only talking about two people who you find two people, sounds like you might even know who they are. You don't need everybody to do it. You just need to train them. I'll give you an example. My daughter, I can remember when she was 16, she kind of sprouted and became a woman real quick. And this 25-year-old young man started to date her. And so I had to show him my knife and gun collection and educate him how this was gonna go. And so he got the message, which was really useful, and he was really, really a great kid. But one day I watched, and I heard her on the phone leaving him for the second day in a row, a horrible message about you didn't call, and you didn't come by, and you didn't do this. And she was beating him up verbally for not showing up. And I stepped in the room, and I heard it the second day in a row, and I said, honey, I said, Everything you're doing right now is training this man to never come to be with you. We're always training each other. When he finally shows up, you bitch at him. You nag at him, you say you didn't do this, you didn't care about this, and he's actually doing what we want, he's showing up. When he shows up, you should be loving him, reinforcing him, saying, oh my gosh, I'm sure you were so busy, I missed the heck out of you, thanks for coming. Then he wants to show up. What he knows now is if I'm late, I'm f So maybe I won't even go. Maybe I'll come up with something bigger. He avoids it. Versus training people do what you want. You need to train people, but you gotta start with you. The real challenge is not your people, it's still you. Even though you got it in your head, there's all these pieces inside yourself. The complexity of your business is like him talking about, I'm the only person that can do this. It's not much different. So if your business is too complex, have another division that does less complex things. Break out a department that's gonna specialize in these three niches that you could separate yourself from other people and be really specific and maybe have more leverage. And then the complex ones that you've already got, get your two people and implement them. What you have to do is stop the stressful thoughts. And the way you stop them is they're still gonna happen because your brain's two million years old. It's going, what if this, what if that? How do I get these people? How? You don't. You just and do it. <laughs> you just go out there and you iterate, you iterate, you iterate. You stop thinking so much and you do more. The more you just do, and when it doesn't work, what do we do? Change your approach, it doesn't work, what do you do? Can you find the way if you keep doing that, yes or no? But most people are so afraid of failing, they got so many stories in their head that they never begin the process. You have to be willing to fail to succeed and it's really not failure, it's just learning. But you gotta make the shift. Does it make sense? Absolutely. Tell me what you're gonna do. Tell me three things you're gonna do that are gonna grow your business geometrically. I'm gonna get the story out of my head. How are you gonna do that? Uh, it's probably gonna be constant work, I would guess. Nope. Uh, <laughs> All you gotta do is develop a habit of erase or stop or that's And all you gotta do is break the pattern like immediately. Don't wait till the little monster is an adult Godzilla eating your business, taking the city. Kill the monster while it's little. The minute you have your thought, you go, that's bullshit. That's an old story. Let me do this instead. You just have to, you get what you tolerate. You get what you tolerate in yourself. You have tolerated these stories. Draw a line in the sand, no more. Do I tell a client that that's when they call asking for my availability? Uh, listen, in my life and business, I've got a seven-year waiting list for people to pay me a million dollars a year to coach them for three sessions a year for two hours each. So scarcity is a good thing, okay. good right? Yeah. And the companies you're talking about, it can be a really good thing. You're just not yeah. owning who you are. If you are who you perceive yourself to be, and I don't think you're exaggerating because you've got the clients, you just aren't owning 100% of where you are. Okay. And the little thing about, I don't want to put this person to that person, I'd handle the objection in a heartbeat at Apple, just say, do you want the best? You can have something cheaper and we can send somebody that's not as good, but 
I really, you came to me because you want the best. You trusted me to put together this complex shoot and it's gonna cost you this little X more, but you're gonna have the very best. Do you want it or not? I'm happy to provide someone else if you want less. You can have oats before they go through the horse or after they've gone through the horse. They're cheaper after they've gone through the horse. <laughs> and for me, in my business, and I'll give this to all of you right now, one of the most valuable things you'll ever do is fire a customer. You must fire customers. How many of you have customers that you hang on to that are a total pain in the ass? They're not grateful, they're not nice, they're mean to you, or they're mean to your people. Raise your hand. One of the first things you should do when you go home is fire them, but do it as a public hanging. I'll give you an example. Years ago, who here has been to Life Mastery or Wealth Mastery, our programs? Okay, quite a few of you. I used to do those programs. It was one long nine-day program. It was actually 12 days at one point. So I took people for 12 days and nights, 12, 13, 14 hours a day. I basically killed people. That's what I did, right? <laughs> but it was an incredible program. But as the years went by, people's scarcity about time changed. How many of you look at time differently today than, say, five or 10 years ago? Quite a bit differently, right? So I had this great program, but I began to realize a lot of people, we only did it once a year. And if you miss those 12 days, you got to wait another year to go to it. And you know, a year later is a long time and some people signed up and they never showed up. We were paid, but I don't want to be paid. I want the person to get the benefit. So I finally sat down with my team and I said, I think nine days is the threshold at that stage. 12, by the time you travel, it's two weeks. Psychologically, it's too much. But nine or 10 days, people are still there. And so we changed to a nine day format. And when we did it, we eliminated three days. But during the program, this was in Hawaii, I used to have a day and a half of just open time. So I eliminated the open time and I cut about a half a day of content. But I did some of the things better. I know how to make it better regardless. So we announced to our clients we're doing this. And I'll never forget, one of my uh, personal account representatives came to me and just said, Mr. Robbins, we're in such trouble. There's this woman and she's so mad and she's telling everybody that you're cheating her. I said, who is that? What do you mean I'm cheating her? She said, you cut the program from 12 days to nine. You've cut two and a half days from the program. And she says, you're cheating her. And she says, she's going to tell everybody that you're cheating her. So I said, you get on the phone with this woman and you let her know that you've had a conversation with me and that she's been to another program. This is a graduate program. So she knows I had a hundred times more value than she could ever pay. And you tell her that I've heard this and that she's banned for life from any program and we will refund all of her money because we need that seat because we only have so many seats. They're all sold out. We want her seat and she's never welcome again at anything I do because she knows better and she's lying. She's just playing this game and I will not tolerate it. And I said, you tell her that. And if she says she's going to threaten other people, tell her, please bring those people and we'll buy their seats as well. And when this happened, what do you think the woman did? First, she got angry and said, you can't keep me from the seminar. <laughs> <laughs> I told him, call her back and said, we are sending her money. We did. And she is not to come and she is never invited again. No one f***s my reputation. If I did something wrong, I'll own it. But she absolutely knows it's not true. There's no excuse for this shit. I will not tolerate. You are fired as a customer. It's a privilege to do business with me, just as my privilege to do business with you. We choose each other. But I can step out any time if you're not going to add value. And I'll do the same thing in this room or any room. Anyone who's disrespectful to the rest of the people here, anyone who really doesn't want to improve, what the fuck are they doing here? Get the fuck out. Here's your money and go. We need your fucking seat. And what do you think this woman did? She showed up in Hawaii at the program and tried to check in. <laughs> and they kept her out and she created a whole scene. They said, would you come talk to her? So I came out to her and I just said, what is it you want? She goes, I want to attend the seminar. I said, no, no, I'm the guy that cheated you, remember? I said, and by the way, like her 20 friends that supposedly were all upset, they all, nobody wanted a refund anymore. And I would not let her in. I let her stay out for a full day. She came back and apologized profusely. And I said, is it sincere? And I said, okay, then you can come in the room. Don't ever pull that shit with me again. Or you're banned for life. You can go find somebody else. Go talk to some positive thinking person. You're not going to get it here. If you take a stand like that, first of all, all my people saw this happen and their eyes were this big. They couldn't believe it. And then they saw these people complaining, stop complaining. And this woman begging to get back in. And I taught all my people, not by my words, but by my actions. There's a standard to do business with me. If you're not going to meet that standard, you can't be a client of mine. I make that choice, just like you make the choice to do business with me. We both mutually choose. 
If you did that, I'd be willing to bet you could stop some of these conversations. I agree. Okay, give her a hand. The Tony Robbins Podcast is directed and hosted by Tony Robbins. Anna York is our editorial director and occasional host. Our executive producer is Carrie Song. Jamie Carvajal and Adriel De La Torre are our digital editors. Special thanks to Mary Buckheit and Diane Adcock for their creative review.